All right, Sully's on the couch and he's ready to go. And I guess you're ready to go. And I'm Ms. Collier. And today on the Tortilla Cat Files, we're going to talk about Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin is one of the most recognized of the founding fathers. If anybody shows you a photo of Benjamin Franklin, you know who he was. But did you know that he's the only one of the founding fathers who signed four of the major documents that created the United States? He signed the Declaration of Independence. He signed the Treaty of Commerce with France that guaranteed economic and military aid to America during the time of the Revolutionary War. He signed the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War, and he signed the U.S. Constitution when it was adopted. So he's kind of a big deal. But what else do we know about him? He was a very interesting man and got up to some interesting shenanigans. And I want to kind of do a deep dive into him today. Well, sort of a deep dive. It would take years to do a deep, deep dive. The man was very old when he died. <clears throat> but let me use my mad skills here and share my screen. That's what I want right there. And I want to start from the beginning. There we go. Okay, so Benjamin Franklin, that's what he looks like. We've seen him. He lives on the $100 bill. There he is. Let me move me right over here. Okay, so in his early life, he was born on January the 17th in 1706 in Boston, which was then part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, because, you know, America was still a bunch of colonies at that point. His father was named Josiah Franklin. He had been born in England, and he was a soap and candle maker. Josiah's first wife, Anne Child, and he had seven children before she died. And then he married again, and his second wife was actually Benjamin Franklin's mother. Her name was, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this because I don't think I've ever actually seen this name before, Abia or Abia Folger, and they had 10 more children. So there were 17 children altogether. Benjamin was the 15th child, and he was the youngest son. Thanks a lot there, Scout. It's like an earthquake. He learned to read very early and he was very interested in education. He really enjoyed going to school. He wanted to learn things, but his father was not doing well financially. 17 kids, got a lot of mouths to feed. And so when Benjamin was 10 years old, he was made to leave school, to quit school and go to work in his father's shop making candles. Now this is what picture over here. This is not Benjamin Franklin, but this is showing how they would make candles. They'd have these huge tubs of wax and they would dip these strings down into them and raise them up and let them harden, get a little bit of wax on them and dip them again and dip them again and dip them again so that each time it would get another layer of wax on them until they got to be big enough, thick enough to be candles. I am certain that this was not a great job, not, 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 a, not a lot of fun. So in an effort to keep Benjamin from running away and joining the, the Navy or, you know, going to sea to be a sailor, his father had him apprenticed when he was 12 years old to his brother, James, who owned a printing shop. Now, apprentice means that you basically sign a contract that for so many years you will work for this person who will teach you how to be a printer or a blacksmith or, you know, whatever it is. And then when you leave, you will have some money because they'll pay you what they were supposed to pay you all along. And you will have the skills that you'll be able to start your own business. It's sort of like trade school back in the old days. During his apprenticeship, he was frequently beaten and mistreated by his brother, James. He began writing, but James refused to publish anything that he wrote because, you know, he's just a kid. He was only 12. And James refused to publish anything. When, when Franklin was 16, he wrote 14 letters calling himself Silence Do Good, who was supposed to be an old widow woman with lots of children who had all these great sayings and good advice to give people. And these were very popular letters and they were all printed in James's newspaper. 
but Benjamin Franklin was the one that wrote him and he was a 16 year old kid. And when James found out about this, he was very angry and he was angry to the point that Benjamin Franklin decided, you know what, time to go. And so in 1723, he left his apprenticeship, even though he still owed his brother three more years and basically ran away from Massachusetts. He went to New York, spent a little bit of time there, but ended up moving on to Philadelphia and settled in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And that's pretty much where he was, that was his official place of residence for most of the rest of his life. In 1724, I can't even talk this morning, 1724, he went to London on the advice of Governor William Keith, who was the governor of Pennsylvania, and he, uh, he was going to buy printing equipment and start his own printing press, <coughs> start his own printing business. Um, he, the governor was supposed to send letters of introduction to people that would help him, help Benjamin buy the stuff he needed, maybe get loan him the money to buy the stuff he needed. Those letters never turned up. And so Benjamin's just over there standing around going, waiting for these letters. And so he ended up having to get work in printing shops, take jobs in printing shops, to be able to earn the money that he needed to buy the stuff that he needed to buy. But while he was there, he went to the theater, he read a lot, he got to swim in the Thames River, and he even in developed wooden swim fins. And these are the wooden swim fins that he developed. I don't know if they're the exact ones or they're just by his design, but this is what he developed. And these are in the Benjamin Franklin Museum in Philadelphia, which is kind of, sounds like it might be a cool place if you're ever in Philadelphia. He stayed in London for 18 months, got what he needed to get, and then returned to Philadelphia. When he had first gone to Philadelphia, back in when he had left his, his brother, he had started staying at a boarding house that was run by a man named James Reed. James had a daughter named Deborah who William, uh, Benjamin, I don't know why I keep wanting to call him William, Benjamin was kind of interested in and they sort of courted a little bit. And then Benjamin went to London. And when he came back after 18 months, he discovered that Deborah had married another guy while, he, while Benjamin was gone. And a couple of months after they'd gotten married, Deborah's new husband had run off and left her. And so here she is, she's now an abandoned woman, still married to this guy, as far as I can find. And, you know, what's she gonna do? So she and, and Benjamin kind of start courting again. In the meantime, Benjamin had a son with somebody else who we never have found out who she is. She's just noted in history as a woman of unfavorable circumstances. And we don't even know what that means. Was she poor? You know, what, what was she? We don't know. We don't know who, we have no idea who this woman was. Do not lick my, do not lick my coffee. Thank you. So William was born in 1730. Uh, Deborah and Benjamin kind of took up together as what's called a common law marriage, which means that they never actually officially got married, but they were together until the end of her life. Uh, she and she took in William, also William, uh, William, who was Benjamin's son, somebody else. And she and and Benjamin had a son named Francis, who was born in 1732, but he died in 1736 of smallpox. They also had a daughter named Sarah, who was born in 1743. Now, I'm not sure that Benjamin was the best husband ever, because he went off to England two different times, and he didn't take Sarah. Uh, either Sarah or Deborah with him. They both stayed in England. He took William, but he left the two girls at home. Uh, Deborah died in 1774 at the age of 66 from a stroke. Benjamin was not in Philadelphia when that happened and he didn't come back when she died. So like I said, I'm not, I'm not sure how devoted a husband he may have been. Now, his son, William Franklin, who was not Deborah's son, was his only surviving son. He would travel to England with Benjamin on his two, he went to, on two different trips after uh, William was born. He traveled to England on both of those trips. He helped with the science experiments and the inventions. 
1762, he became New Jersey's royal governor of the, the colony of New Jersey. But when the revolution started and everything started going badly for the people who still supported the king, <coughs> excuse me, he was removed from office in 1776 and actually put in prison, not because he was doing anything illegal or anything, but he was at that point still supporting the king of england and so he was put in prison for that he finally got out of prison after years and his father didn't do anything to try to get him out of prison which didn't sit well with william when he got out he left for england when he was released and he and his father never saw each other again and as far as anybody knows they never spoke to each other or communicated in any way that relationship went bad and it went bad in a big way and it just kind of ended. It was sort of sad. Okay, while he was living in Philadelphia, Benjamin continued working as a printer, and in 1730, he was named the official printer of Philadelphia. In 1731, he formed the first public library. Now, this was a subscription library. What we have now are free libraries, where all you have to have is a library card, and you go in and you check out whatever books you want. You know, they may tell you you can only have five books or whatever, but that's, that's fine. And you can check them out, and you keep them for two weeks, you bring them back and then you can check out more now this was a subscription library which means it was kind of like a streaming service you know if you have disney or, or or one of the streaming services there's a fee that you pay at the beginning of the month like 6.99 or whatever it is and then you can watch everything on their show on their, their channel except if they have some special stuff that you have to pay extra for that's a subscription that's what this library was like you had a subscription that you paid at the each month and then you could check out anything and read anything in the library but it was a paid library but it was the beginning of the library system in the united states what became the united states he also purchased the pennsylvania gazette which was a newspaper that wasn't doing really well and under his leadership um, this newspaper became one of the the biggest newspapers in the state of pennsylvania and he also helped organize the first volunteer fire department in Philadelphia. And in 1732, he published Poor Richard's Almanac. Now, an almanac, you can still get almanacs today. In fact, I was watching on the news the other day, yeah, it was day before yesterday, and they were talking about how the almanac for last year had predicted you remember that big snowstorm we had in texas in 2020 and 2021 in february where the power it snowed and all the power went out and it was horrible if you go back and look at the almanac from the year before it predicted that snowstorm and they were showing on the page where it did and it, it did it didn't say all oh, the power is going to go out but it said you know there would be heavy snow in texas it would last for several days and that's what happened and this was printed the whole year before who knows but almanacs are like that. They tell you what the weather's going to be. They give you quotes. They give you advice. They give you little funny stories, all this kind of thing. Uh, Poor Richard's Almanac was published for 25 years, and that's what helped make Benjamin Franklin famous and wealthy. So by 1748, he was one of the richest men in Pennsylvania. He was 42 years old then. So he turned his printing business over to his partner and he began working on science and his science stuff was really interesting. He was very interested in math as well. And on a voyage from England back to the United States or back to America, he actually discovered the Gulf Stream, which is that a tide that runs through the ocean and was able to figure out a way that if a ship steered a certain way through and kind of caught the Gulf Stream, it could cut two weeks off of a voyage from England to the to America, which is kind of a big deal. So very smart man. In 1752 is where he probably did his experiment with the kite where he was looking into electricity and he didn't discover electricity he just found a way it could be conducted electricity already existed uh he did invent the um 
the lightning rod after he had done that experiment. And the reason I say he probably did it is some scientists today dispute that he actually could have done this experiment because the way he wrote about it, they think that if he had done the experiment the way he wrote about it, it probably would have killed him. But we don't know. We know he wrote about doing the experiment. We know that he wrote uh, tenants for how these types of experiments were done in the future. So we don't know one way or the other. Anyway, he did write about doing this experiment. We do know that. He also, for reasons, wanted to revise the alphabet and get rid of the letters C, J, Q, W, X, and Y. I have no idea why. Apparently he just didn't like those and he kind of thought that the sounds of those letters could all be made with other letters. I don't know. It, it seems like sort of an, an odd uh, thing to want to do, but he kind of mentioned that, but he didn't actually do it. He invented a lot of things. Move out of the way of that. Whoop. He invented the Franklin stove, which was a more open concept stove. And you could, in most places, you could go stand all the way around the stove instead of just it being a fireplace built into the wall. And it radiated more heat into a room than just a fireplace did. He invented bifocals. You can see the little line on those glasses right there. Bifocals has two different lenses. I'm actually wearing bifocals right now that are set into the same glasses frame. The bottom part of the lens is for reading stuff that's close up to you so that when you're you know, holding the stuff up to your face, you can look down through those lenses. The top part <coughs> was glasses to let you see far off. So when you look up, you can see far off. It meant that you didn't have to switch back and forth between, oh, I gotta have these, these are my reading glasses, oh, I gotta have these to be able to drive with, that kind of thing. It was. That, that would have been a nightmare. Um, this is a rocking chair. He invented the rocking chair, apparently. And this is a glass harmonica. Now, when I first saw that, I thought somebody had messed up and misspelled harmonica, but that's not right. An harmonica was a series of glasses drilled through the center and set onto a pole that could be turned and then the, these glasses were dipped down as they were turned down into a little tub of water so that the glasses were wet and somebody could play music on them. Bass is not happy, sorry about that. <coughs> this was a very popular instrument during its time. Um, I mean we don't see them now because they're kind of delicate and hard to deal with but Mozart and Beethoven both uh, wrote music for this instrument. So it was a very popular instrument. And if we have time at the end, I have a clip that I can maybe show you if it'll work with my mad technical skills that um, is a, a person playing one of these. But this was one of his favorite inventions, the glass harmonica. Okay, put me back up here. As far as slavery was concerned, in 1748, Franklin purchased the first of several enslaved people that he would own over the years, but his views changed over time to the point that in 1760, he freed all of the people that he owned. He freed all of his slaves and he didn't own any more slaves. And actually in 1790, he petitioned the US Congress to make all slavery illegal everywhere in the United States. So he did, you know, get to be, have a better idea about things as time went on. Politics, as well as being a scientist, he was also very involved in politics. In 1757, he was appointed to serve as the agent to England where he was, he went back to England and he lived for almost 20 years to kind of, you know, try to settle a dispute that was going on between England and Pennsylvania. He returned to Philadelphia in 1762, and then in 1764, he was sent back to England, and he spoke out about, against the Stamp Act, which was the act, one of the intolerable acts, where businesses had to put a stamp on everything, 
And that kind of helped lead to the Boston Tea Party and various things. It was a very unpopular act. And his speaking at Parliament about this act, speaking out against it, helped to get it repealed. In 1775, he was elected to the Second Continental Congress, and he was actually appointed at that Congress. He was appointed the first postmaster general of all of the colonies. In 1776, he was one of five men who helped draft the Declaration of Independence, and then he signed the Declaration of Independence as well. After he had signed the Declaration of Independence, he was sent as an ambassador to France to negotiate the treaty for the military and economic support to help the, the colonies fight against England. He was very popular in France. The king liked him, everybody liked him. In 1783, he was still over there. He helped negotiate a treaty of Paris that ended the Revolutionary War, and he returned to Philadelphia in 1785. Whoops. He attended, in 1787, he was elected to represent Pennsylvania at the Constitutional Convention where they were going to write the Constitution. He was 81, so he was the oldest delegate there. He helped craft the Great Compromise, which gave the, the United States had two houses that it was going to, to have as part of its government. The lower house, the House of Representatives, um, would give proportional representation so the bigger states got more people to represent them. The um, upper house, the Senate, everybody got two senators. No matter how big the state was, no matter how small the state was, everybody got two senators because there was this big dispute between the small states and the large states. The large states wanted to have proportional representation so then they'd have more influence. But the small states wanted to have equal representation so that they wouldn't just get left out of everything. So the Great Compromise kind of was the best of both of those things. He also founded the Society for Political Inquiries, which was a society dedicated to improving knowledge of the government, where people could write in and ask questions and find out information about the government, since it was a new system now. He died April the 17th in 1790 in Philadelphia. He was 84 when he died. He left most of his estate to his daughter, whose name at that point was Sarah Bash. I guess she had gotten married. He left almost nothing to his son, William. <coughs> he was buried with Deborah in Philadelphia Christ Church. And the headstone reads, this is a headstone, you can't hardly see it, but the headstone reads Benjamin and Deborah Franklin, 1790, which is weird because she didn't die in 1790. He did. It's a little bit odd, but okay. But when he was 22, he had written his own epitaph. And this is what he wanted put on his headstone. He wanted it to say, the body of B. Franklin, a printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here, food for worms, but the work shall not be lost, for it will for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more elegant edition, revised and corrected by the author. They didn't put that on his tombstone. They put Benjamin Franklin and Deborah Franklin, 1790, because this was going to take a lot to do. So that's all I have there. Let's stop that. Let's see if we can do this, if this is going to work for me. This is a lady, if this is going to work, this is a lady playing the harmonica. Let's see. Yeah, keep going.
Okay, so that's what one sounds like. And I notice here that she doesn't have this one where it goes down into the tub of water like the ones that I had seen on other things did. She's got little cups of water here. See one here, one here. And I guess she dips her fingers into those and then plays that the music with that. <coughs> But that's what an harmonica sounds like. It's kind of cool, right? Don't run out and buy one. I think they're probably very expensive and your mom won't like it. But that's all I have for you about Benjamin Franklin. I learned some stuff doing the, this, the research on this that I didn't know. I didn't know about that glass harmonica thing, which is kind of cool. I learned some other stuff. I hope you've learned something. I hope that if you are interested, there are lots of books about Benjamin Franklin. Read some of them if you're interested. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Please let me know what you thought, what you'd like to know more about. Leave me a comment, say hi. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Okay, Sully, we're done.